welcome to my webinar, Preparing for the FAFSA and CSS Profile. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tina Steele, the FAFSA guru. I founded this business about seven years ago after working in the field of higher education for over 25 years, uh, having expertise in financial aid. And what I found when I worked in, in that field is that there, were a, there was a really big gap between the needs of families and the, the help that was available to them when it came to financial aid. I worked in a number of financial aid offices, and while they are wonderful at answering families' questions, they are also overloaded and cannot meet everybody's needs. And if you've ever tried to call an 800 number associated with financial aid, you know how frustrating that can be. So I decided to go out on my own and open this business and work with families and help them navigate the overwhelming financial aid process, along with maximize their financial aid offers. So I've developed a number of programs over the last several several years to guide families through this process and I offer a limited number of consultations to work with families and I always host this webinar this time of year as we're getting ready for the financial aid season to kick off. The FAFSA and the CSS profile open up October 1st so there is a lot to get ready for and I plan to go over the ins and outs with you, uh, things you need to be thinking about and doing prior to filling out the FAFSA and CSS profile along with going over some common mistakes that I I see a lot of families make when filling out this form that can cost you thousands of dollars. So I want you to avoid these mistakes. After I go through that material at the end, I'm just going to share a few of my programs and services that I have available to help you through this process if you're looking for assistance. And if you stay tuned all the way through the end, I'm offering a special discount for anyone who signs up for one of my programs. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And what I like to do, I am including a live Q&A session at the end of this, but what I like to do is go through the complete webinar and then at the end, I'll answer all of your questions. So if you have one along the way, go ahead and feel free to type it in the chat box, but I'm going to wait until the end to answer it just so that I'm getting all the information out and this webinar isn't super choppy. Uh, sometimes it can be that way when I stop and answer questions throughout it. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And again, I just wanted to welcome you to getting prepared for the FAFSA and CSS profile. And what I plan to cover in this is creating an FSA ID. I'm gonna explain what that is and why you need it and give you some important tips about creating it. I'm going to talk to you about preparing for the FAFSA and CSS profile, along with common FAFSA and CSS profile mistakes to avoid that I see many families make. And then at the end, as I mentioned, I'll go over some programs and services that I provide to help families navigate the financial aid process. And again, if you stay tuned till the very end, you'll get access to a special discount on the programs that I offer. So are you ready? The 22-23 FAFSA and CSS profile open up at midnight on October 1st. We are just about two weeks away. I mentioned when I first came on that I have about 30 years of experience working in financial aid, but I'm also mom and stepmom of six children, two college graduates, two current college students, and two current high school students, one of which is a senior right now. So not only do I have the professional experience, but I'm also a parent and I've been right where you are. So first, let's talk about the FSA ID. What is it? An FSA ID is a unique username and password that allows students and parents to electronically access financial aid documents and is needed to electronically sign the FAFSA along with other important financial aid paperwork. Both the student and one parent, if the student is dependent, needs to create their own unique user, uh, excuse me, their own unique FSA ID prior to completing the FAFSA. How do, you, how do you create an FSA ID? You simply go to the website listed. Oh, somebody just said that I'm cutting in and out, and I hope that is not my connection. If others are having the same problem, if you could let me know, that would be great. Uh, so anyways, for creating an FSA ID, you go to the website listed here, fsaid.ed.gov, and you're going to click on create an FSA ID. Now, the reason that I say that you should be doing this now in September prior to filling out the FAFSA is because it does take one to three days for the Social Security Administration to verify your identity before you can actually use this ID to electronically 
automatically sign your FAFSA. So what happens a lot of times is students and parents go in in October to the FAFSA, they go in to fill it out and they get to the very end and it's it asks them to sign it with their FSA ID that they have not yet created, which they then need to go create it and wait several days for the Social Security Administration to verify it before the FAFSA will be submitted. So that's why I encourage all of you watching this webinar, when the webinar is over sometime this month, create that FSA ID at least several days prior to when you plan on filling out the FAFSA form. And hopefully I'm not cutting out anymore. My connection seems very stable. Like I said, I'm not sure if others are experiencing that, but hopefully uh, that's not happening. One word of caution I have for all of you, keep your FSA ID in a safe place. It is so frustrating and tedious to reset it and create it this month. I, I can tell you and with all the families that I've worked with, sometimes it takes longer to actually reset or retrieve an FSA ID than it does to actually um, fill out your FAFSA form. So you don't want to lose this. You're going to use this ID each and every year that you fill out the FAFSA form. Form. So put it in a safe place and don't forget it. Record it in the notes, like in a locked note on your phone, write it in a on a piece of paper and keep it somewhere at home that you can always access it. This is one of the most frustrating things that students and parents go through. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the FAFSA. The free application for federal student aid is what you use to apply for federal and state financial aid, and you're going to fill this form out every single year that you're applying for money. The type of financial aid that the FAFSA covers includes the Pell Grant, which is a federal grant, and SEOG Grant, which is another federal grant, along with state-specific grants. Now, grants from the FAFSA tend to go to more of students who are lower income, so they're more need-based. There's also something known as federal work study that allows a student to get a job working on campus and they can earn a paycheck for the work that they do. And then lastly, federal direct student loans and parent plus loans. In order to apply for these, you have to fill out a FAFSA. Now, a lot of people associate financial aid with free money, but the federal direct student loan and the parent plus loan are federally funded loans with low interest rates and good terms. And the federal direct student loan is not based on credit. So that's a loan the student can get in their own name without needing a co-signer. So if you want to borrow these loans, you have to have a FAFSA on file. The FAFSA opens at midnight on October 3rd, uh, excuse me, on October 1st of this year for, for the 22-23 academic year. You cannot go in and get started early. I've had a lot of people reach out and ask me that. It's going to be based on prior year income information. So we're looking at using 2020 taxes to fill out the FAFSA that opens up this October. It does need to complete it each year, as I mentioned, even if you don't think you'll qualify for much aid. The two big reasons for that are in order to even borrow those loans I just mentioned, you have to have a FAFSA on file. And then the other reason is if you want to appeal your financial aid offer, which is what I recommend every student and family do, you have to have a, a FAFSA on file to do that so that you can get a financial aid offer. Students are going to fill this form out with their parents if they are dependent. Uh, so it's best if you fill it out together. Okay, here are some things you need to know about completing the FAFSA. File it early. The more, the, the earlier you file, the more money you can receive. Also, some states have their own FAFSA deadlines in order to qualify for state grant money. So depending on the state you live in, you would want to check what the FAFSA deadline is to make sure you're getting that FAFSA submitted prior to that date so you're being considered for a state grant. So for example, I'm in Maine. Maine's FAFSA deadline is May 1st. Now, that means in order for me to be considered for a state grant, I would have to fill out the FAFSA by May 1st. However, the FAFSA opens in October. So I'm gonna fill out, out early anyways because I want to be considered for the maximum amount of aid. So do not wait until the last minute. Don't wait until these state deadlines. I encourage everybody to fill out a FAFSA form in October. Also with the FAFSA, there are a few protected assets you do not have to report. One would be retirement accounts. Another is the equity of the primary home that you live in. And then uh, this does not include other real estate. So if you own other property, such as rental property or a seasonal you know, vacation home, you would count that as an asset on the FAFSA, just not your primary home or your primary residence. 
And also you don't have to report business value if you have less than 100 employees. So these are three protected assets that you do not have to report on the FAFSA. Also, if you're divorced or separated or your parents are divorced or separated, let's take parents first. So if you're a dependent student filling out this form with your parent and they're divorced or separated, only one parent needs to fill out the FAFSA. This would be the parent with whom the child resided with most within the last year. And if that parent is remarried, then the step parents' income and assets also need to be reported. A lot of, a lot of parents make this mistake and they don't realize that and it can cause problems and delays. Even if the step parent is not supporting the child or contributing towards the education, their income and assets will be considered on the FAFSA form. If you're an independent student and you're divorced or separated, then you're just going to list your income and asset information on the FAFSA and not your spouses or your ex-spouses. So if you happen to file a joint tax return for 2020 and you recently are divorced or you're recently separated, it's going to be very important when you fill this form out that you do not use the IRS data retrieval tool. That's a tool in the FAFSA that electronically links to your taxes and uploads them to the FAFSA form. And if you use that and you filed a joint return, it's going to pull in that joint income information, which you do not want to do. So you're going to want to bypass that and manually enter your tax information on the form. This is a common question I get. I like to go over because sometimes students are applying to more than 10 colleges, specifically any high school seniors that I might have on this webinar. And you can only list up to 10 colleges on the FAFSA form. So if you have more than 10, what you need to do is list 10. You submit the FAFSA, let it process. It takes about 72 hours for all that information to be sent to those colleges. And then you log back into the FAFSA to make what's called a correction. You're going to navigate to the colleges section, delete some colleges, and then add the new ones and resubmit the FAFSA. The other way to do that is to call the, the FAFSA phone number, which I have listed here, and have them add the additional colleges for you. But it can take a while to get somebody on the phone and be really frustrating. So I usually recommend going with the first option. Okay, so let's talk about some common FAFSA mistakes to avoid. So a lot of times I'll get families that call me when they get their expected family contribution or financial aid offers and they're panicking only to realize they made a mistake on the FAFSA. So the first mistake is to not fill it out because you might qualify for some financial aid that you don't, that you, that you might otherwise not think you will. And also remember in order to appeal your financial aid, you have to fill out a FAFSA and get a financial aid offer. Filling it out late, missing important deadlines. Sometimes colleges have their own FAFSA deadlines. So you want to check on those in addition to the state. But if you fill out this FAFSA in October, you'll be fine. You will be meeting every deadline there is to meet. Another mistake, reporting spouse's income assets when divorced or separated. This is a really, really big one. You do not wanna make this mistake. Reporting the value of retirement accounts in your primary home as an asset. Again, that can really inflate your expected family contribution and make have a negative impact on your financial aid offer. Using the IRS data retrieval tool when divorced or separated and filed a joint return. I just went over that. Very important that you do not do that. If you happen to own a 529 plan for your child, reporting that as a student asset versus parent is another big mistake that people make. All 529 plans should be reported as a parent asset on the FAFSA. Not adding all the colleges that you're applying to. If you don't add the college on the FAFSA, the information will not get submitted to them. They will not put together a financial aid offer for you. Not creating your FSA ID prior to filling out. Uh, like I mentioned, that's a, something that will save you some time and frustration. So you wanna make sure you do that first. And then not reading definitions carefully. Click the I button next to the question for more information or details about what to report. Every question on the FAFSA will have a little I button with a circle next to it that you can click on and expand and it'll tell you exactly what they're looking for, what they want you to list there for untaxed income, for assets, for investments. So click that little I button to make sure that you're not misreporting anything. Another mistake I see is a dependent student going in to fill out the FAFSA themselves and then bypassing the parent information because there is a question that asks, do you want to skip information about your parents? And if they do that and submit it, it's going to be incomplete and cause a significant delay. And then technically, 
it wouldn't be submitted until the date the parent actually submits their information. So you want to just make sure as the parent, you're kind of going through this with your child or doing it, you know, on your own versus just letting them go through and, and do it themselves. And then lastly, another big mistake I see, forgetting to sign the FAFSA at the end with your FSA IDs. You actually have to put your IDs in and click a little button that says sign this FAFSA. And after that, you have to hit the submit button for it to submit and be processed. I see this happen all the time. Somebody goes in and fills everything out in October and then December rolls around and they're wondering why they haven't heard anything and they realize they never submitted it. So then when they go back and hit submit, they just, it looks like they're just submitting their FAFSA for the first time and they're not getting all that credit for submitting it early and it can impact their financial aid. So very, very important. Okay. So that's a little bit about preparing for the FAFSA. Now I'm going to move into the CSS profile because this is another very important financial aid form that is put out by the College Scholarship Service. And some private and public colleges require this in order to determine the amount of institutional grants and scholarships to offer. It's much more in depth than the FAFSA and it takes longer to complete. And unlike the FAFSA, no assets are protected on this form. So the best way to figure out if the college that you're going to requires this form is to simply Google colleges that require CSS profile. It's going to pull up a list of them and then you can cross reference your list to see whether or not you need to submit this. I have talked to so many families that have no idea what the CSS profile is until after the deadline passed and they missed filling it out, which means they missed out on thousands of dollars in an institutional scholarship. And I do not want to see that happen to you. So here's what you need to know. Colleges use this form to determine how much of their institutional scholarship money to award. Awards can vary significantly between colleges. You could, it really depends on how much endowment money they have to offer. You know, you could have two $50,000 colleges side by side submitting the same CSS profile to, and one could come back and give you a $30,000 institutional scholarship, while the other could come back and give you a $15,000 scholarship. It just depends on how much money they have to offer. You want to always refer to each college for their CSS deadline. It should be listed on their website under their financial aid office. Missing this deadline means you do not get to receive any of this free institutional scholarship money. Like I said, I've seen it happen many times. This form opens up October 1st, just like the FAFSA does. It's much more tedious, so you want to set aside a couple of hours to fill it out. And unlike the FAFSA, it's not free to complete. It does cost $25 for the first college and then $16 to submit to each college after that. Uh, you may or may not have to complete the CSS profile every year. It depends on the college. Whereas the FAFSA, you do have to complete that every year. Some colleges will only have a family complete it one time and then give them an award of institutional scholarship money for all four years. Whereas other colleges will require the student to fill it out every single year. So make sure you know what your particular college requires so you don't miss filling this out in the future. Now, another thing about the CSS profile that's different than the FAFSA, even if you're divorced or separated, then you both still need to fill out a CSS profile. There's a custodial form and a non-custodial form for both households. Uh, also, step parents' information needs to be reported if, if either parent is remarried. So when colleges are awarding this institutional scholarship money, they want to make sure they're getting a very accurate picture of both of the parent households, even if they're divorced or separated, before they're giving away this free money, which is why both custodial and non-custodial parent have to do it. There is what's called a non-custodial parent waiver where you could actually um, get a waiver for one parent not to fill this out, but usually it has to be in a strange situation. Maybe the student never has had contact with the parent uh, or a very unhealthy situation that can be documented. So they don't give this parent waiver out eas easily. They don't give it out just for parents that aren't willing to help pay for their child's education. In that case, they would still have to fill out this form. So to fill out the CSS profile, you wanna to go to the College Board website, which I have listed here. Students can log in with the College Board account they use to register for the SAT, but parents need to create their own accounts in order to fill this form out and sign it. 
So I encourage all of you to go to this website and explore it a little more this month. They have some great tutorials in there to help you prepare for the CSS profile and things that you need to know. So I uh, absolutely recommend that you spend a little bit of time exploring that if any of the colleges that you're applying to require this form. So as I mentioned, the FAFSA and CSS profile open up for completion on October 1st. Keep in mind the system will be glitchy the first few days. So don't worry about getting right in there October 1st because you might be frustrated. The system crashes a lot because there's so many people getting in there trying to fill them out. If you get the FAFSA and the CSS profile completed in October, you will be doing great. Make sure you have a copy of your 2020 taxes and W-2s available when you are filling out these forms because you will need some information from them. Even if you're using the IRS data retrieval tool for the FAFSA, you'll still need to refer to your W-2s and then you'll need copies of your taxes for the CSS profile. Okay, so what the, the thing I want to stress the most about this, you know, this webinar is kind of a quick nutshell, preparing for the FAFSA and CSS profile, things you need to do to get ready, giving you some ideas of common mistakes. But I just want to stress that applying for financial aid consists of so much more than just filling out the FAFSA. I often get calls from panicking parents in the spring when financial aid offers start coming out. And I don't want any of you to be that parent. Now is the time to prepare. So, you know, if you wait until those financial aid offers roll out, like in March or April, you know, you're missing out on all this crucial time, things that you could be doing, making sure you're filling out all the paperwork, searching and applying for outside scholarships, you know, making sure you're completing the verification process if you're selected or you're reporting special circumstances to the financial aid office where they can actually recalculate your EFC and award more financial aid. I mean, you want to be researching your best loan options, completing promissory notes and entrance counseling. You want to understand what your financial aid offers consist of and know how to accept and decline the different types of aid. And probably one of the most important things, you want to understand how to effectively appeal your financial aid offer. So now I'm gonna just get into for a few short minutes, the programs and services that I offer that can help all of you stay on track and really help you maximize those financial aid offers. Uh, I have my Financial Aid Academy, which is my signature program, Financial Aid 101 Masterclass, and then of course I do offer a limited number of one-on-one -on -one consultations. So with my Financial Aid Academy, this is a 10-month digital course and coaching program with me that I upload new content to monthly. It includes webinars, videos, tutorials, financial aid and scholarship resources, and there's three different levels of service available. So this, the Academy for this year started in August and it runs through May. But this, you're not too late to join. You're actually, I get a lot of families that sign up in September and October as they begin searching for all this financial aid information. There, uh, as I said, there's three different levels of service, the basic, the plus, and the pro. And the two higher levels of service, which are the plus and the pro, in addition to the digital course, include direct access to me all year for, for all of your financial aid questions as they arise, membership in a private Facebook group, live monthly webinars, along with one-on-one -on -one consultations for the highest level of service. So just to give you an idea of some of the topics that the Academy includes, uh, understand, understanding how colleges determine a financial aid package, breaking down the EFC, finding colleges that are within your reach financially, how to determine what colleges offer better financial aid packages, more in-depth preparing for the FAFSA and CSS profile. I also have a FAFSA completion tutorial uploaded into the Academy that will take you step-by-step -step through completing it. Uh, I teach you how to report special circumstances to the financial aid office, how to write an effective financial aid appeal letter, how to complete the verification process, I go over private loan options, parent loan options, uh, how to close the financial aid gap. And one of the most important things that so many students miss is how to effectively search for and find outside scholarships, which is a whole separate piece of the financial aid process other than the FAFSA and CSS profile. I see so many students leaving money on the table and not searching for these. So in the academy, I go over, I go over this in depth and provide a lot of scholarship resources. 
what you can do to maximize your aid, comparing your financial aid offers, accepting your aid offers, and then everything that comes after that. So there's essentially something to do each and every month throughout the entire year to stay on track with financial aid. Just to give you an idea of the program cost for the Financial Aid Academy, the basic level is $199 for the entire year, gives you access just to the digital course. The plus level, which is my mid-level range, this is the most popular. It costs $599, but you can save $100 if you pay in full. And the thing about the plus level, along with the pro level, is these are the two levels that include the direct access to me throughout the entire year for all your questions membership in a private Facebook group, live monthly webinars that I host, along with one-on-one -on -one consultations. And that highest level that you see, pro level, it just includes everything in the plus level in addition to two one-on-one -on -one consultations with me. So I have payment plans available. And as you can see, I've tried to create different levels of service to really make this price point affordable for, for all families. And for all of you that, this is the little gift I'm giving to all of you. For all of you that joined uh, this webinar, I am offering 20% off coupons for the first 100 people who sign up for either my academy or masterclass. I'm gonna go over my masterclass next. You'll simply use the coupon code FAFSA20 during checkout when you sign up for one of the programs and you'll get that 20% discount. Okay, so now the Financial Aid 101 Masterclass. This is what I refer to as a financial aid crash course. This is for students, whether you're traditional or non-traditional parents or even professionals who want to better understand the financial aid process, learn how to confidently navigate it, and how to get the best financial aid offers possible. So kind of like a condensed version of the academy without the coaching piece from me. And, and it also wouldn't give you the direct access to me for all the financial aid questions and the private Facebook group and the monthly webinars, since this would be kind of a course that you go through on your own. It's broken down into six sections and it's intended for you to go at your own pace. So I, a lot of times I have parents of like high school students that aren't quite seniors that just want to learn more about the financial aid process. This would be a great class for you or professionals in the field or somebody that doesn't really want to go through the whole 10-month coaching program for me. This program uh, costs $149. Just remember, it's not quite as in-depth as the academy and doesn't include the coaching and guidance from me throughout the entire year, but it's still a wonderful program and will give you a lot of information and teach you everything you need to know about financial aid. And again, 20% off is available for uh, the first 100 people who sign up for this class or the academy. Just use the, the code FAFSA20. Okay. To learn more, head over to my website, thefafsaguru.com. You can click on uh, Financial Aid Academy at the top of my website. You can also click on Financial Aid 101 Masterclass. You'll see both of them there. It'll give you a lot more information about what the programs entail, and then you can sign up directly through my website. And then lastly, I do offer one-on-one -on -one consultations. I used to do more of these, but as my business has grown and I've developed these programs, my time is more limited. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't do as, as many as I used to. But if you just have a preference to work one-on-one -on -one with me, you don't want to do any of the group Co uh, programs or coaching, then you can book a call with me. I just require a, minima, a minimum of a 30-minute session. Uh, the prices are outlined here. And to schedule this, you just go to my website or email me at tina at thefafsaguru.com. And as you'll notice, because of my consultation fees, my programs really do offer the best value because remember in that my most popular program, which is the Financial Aid Academy Plus, you get access to me for the for 10 months throughout the entire year for any and all questions you have versus the one-on-one -on -one call. Now, the one-on-one -on -one consultation will be via Zoom face-to-face, -face, whereas the answers to all of your questions would be via email or in my private Facebook group. So it is a little bit different that way, but, but still there's a lot of value um, in those programs. Okay, so that's it. I wanted to try to get through all this in 30 minutes and I think I actually did it in just 30 minutes, which is wonderful. I want to thank you all for joining me and wish you all the best of luck as you get ready to prepare for your FAFSA and CSS profile. Uh, and be sure to visit my website, thefafsaguru.com, if you have any other um, questions or you want to learn more about the programs and services that I provide.